Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of uh, 30th of July 2020 today. Uh, if you're on vacation and watching this, that's really nice. If you're at work <laughs> and watching this, also great. Uh, it's my pleasure to host you together with my colleague uh, Florian Doster uh, from Heriot Wack University. Florian became full professor recently, so congratulations as well. So Sebastian is on vacation and Florian was really kind to, to help us organize this week webinar. Thanks a lot again. Um, hosting you from TU Delft and Heriot Watt at the same time is only possible because of this online technology, otherwise it wouldn't have been that easy. So it's great to, to host you and we are so pleased to host you this week. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done it uh, so far. In what your colleagues, uh, students, uh, res other researchers interested in porous media and geosciences, that would also allow you automatically receive uh, notifications for the upcoming uh, live webinar. To our student attendees, also please note uh, there is an initiative uh, uh, called Poros Media Tea Time Talks series uh, that would allow you broaden your network and, and give also talk about your own research as well. Now to the lecture of uh, this week, we are pleased uh, and honored to announce our keynote speaker of this week is Professor Reiner Helmick. Well, Reiner doesn't need an uh, introduction from me, but I will read a few lines about him. Reiner is chair of the Department of Hydromechanics and Modeling of Hydrosystems in the Institute for Modeling Hydraulic and Environmental Systems at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. Reiner graduated in civil engineering at the University of Applied Sciences in Munster and also University of Hannover. He received his PhD from the University of Hannover. He then joined the University of Stuttgart as research assistant and also finished his habilitation there too. Then he moved to the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany to become acting professor for numerical methods and information processing. After about two years, he returned back to Stuttgart. So only two years leaving Stuttgart was, I guess, enough for you, Reiner, or you missed Stuttgart too much. He returned back to Stuttgart. <laughs> I will tell you this <laughs> later on. <laughs> Why? To, be, to become professor of hydromechanics and modeling of hydrosystems. <clears throat> as the director of the Institute for Modeling Hydraulic and Environmental Systems. Reiner has been in a number of scientific boards and committees, for example, in the board of the Journal of Advances in Water Resources and also Computational Geosciences. He was also elected member uh, and elected chairman of the Senate Commission on Water Research of the German Research Foundation, DFG, and many more. He was the president of Interpor Society, International Society for Porous Media, between 2009 and 2011, and Darcy Lecturer of 2015, selected by the U.S. National Groundwater Association. He has been the main supervisor of over 40 PhD candidates so far, and in the committee of over 100 candidates, and I stand one of them. Uh, Reiner has received uh, many awards during his remarkable career, including Dresden Prize for Groundwater Research, elected member of the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, elected member of the National Academy of Science and Engineering, and also Interpor Honorary Lifetime Membership Award. That's the most prestigious award of the society, Interpor. He's also appointed as adjunct professor at the University of Bergen in Norway between 2019 and 2021. He has organized dozens of international conferences. I myself have had the pleasure uh, of co-chairing the Interpol Scientific Program Committee with him for the past couple of years. Uh, Reiner's research spans a wide range of fundamental developments in understanding the complex multi-scale multi-physics flow and transport in porous media. <coughs> significantly advanced science and industry in many applications, including geosciences, food, and agriculture. It's our pleasure and honor to host you, Reiner, uh, in this webinar series. To the audience, please note, uh, Reiner's lecture will last for about half an hour, 30 minutes followed by questions and discussions. And uh, like before, please type in your questions in the chat room. 
Florian will kindly chair the discussion session after Reiner's talk. Uh, please do not also wait until the end of the talk. Feel free to post your questions anytime you feel appropriate. Reiner, thanks uh, once more. The stage uh, is is all yours. Uh, Hari and, um, and Florian, thanks a lot for this very kind invitation. It's really an honor and a pleasure for me. And please believe me, my friends, it's a pleasure and an honor to work with both of them together. <laughs> okay. Let me start. I think I will give you a presentation of about interfaces in Paris media. And I believe these interfaces are always everywhere. And the question is really, do we need these interfaces on the different scales? And is this then the case for a multi-scale concept? And uh, what I would like to show is based on uh, two Postdocs, they have done the PhD with us together. It's Martin and Kilian. These are three other um, doctoral students, Ned from the United States, Katharina and Melanie. At first, I will give you a short motivation. You see here, one minute, I will use my laser pointer. You see here a porous media and uh, you see the gray color that is the solid phase, then the yellow one and the blue one. That means, for instance, there are different kinds of fluids involved. If we have a look a little bit more into the details, then we see a lot of interfaces. We can have here a solid uh, fluid interface. We can have fluid fluid solid interfaces in the porous media. And the porous media can interact with a free flow system. Then we have another kind of interface. I will come back to this later on. Or the porous media can act from both sides. That means that the free flow is included in the porous media. What are the key application areas? On one, uh, please, uh, you can believe me, that is related to biomechanics. This is, for instance, here a part of a brain done uh, and analyzed by our formal PhD student, Timo Koch. And you see here three different kinds of vascular systems, and they are embedded in the tissue, and the tissue is the porous media. That means there is a strong interaction between the um, vascular system and, of course, the surrounding tissue, the porous media. And these three type uh, tubes are embedded in the porous media. With other words, there's a strong interaction and different kinds of interfaces are involved. Another example is related to a technical application. That's a fuel cell here. And uh, you know this, I'm 100% sure that uh, you can uh, um, produce electricity with this hemo um, electrical process based on the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. And on one hand, you have the gas distributor here. That's the free flow system. It's related to this one here. And this interact with the diffusive layer and it's a highly complex porous media. And the question is really, how does this interact with each other? What kind of interfaces are relevant? And last not least, I will come to an example that is more related to uh, the environment. Uh, this is for instance here, the unsaturated zone and the unsaturated zone interact immediately with the atmosphere. And the question is really, uh, is it relevant to get these two compartments as good as possible coupled? And what kind of interfaces are relevant? And what kind of processes at the interface are relevant to solve, for instance, evaporation processes? So let me come at first to the definitions. Here's an example, for instance, that is salt precipitation. Uh, that's a really, really big environmental problem. If you have an increase of the evaporation related to this climate change processes, then it can be that you get salt precipitation processes. And then with this salt precipitation processes, it can be that uh, you get two separated systems. That means the atmosphere uh, is not longer uh, interacting with the porous media, with the unsaturated zone. Okay, let us go into the details. At first, I will give you an impression about interfaces on the pore scale and on the RV scale. And the question is how we can transfer this. Let me start at first, I mentioned this so far, this is the interface, fluid, fluid, solid interface. The question is here, how we can get this fluid, fluid, solid interface 
on the free flow included in an REV based concept where we have only volume based quantities. The second one is we have interfaces in a free flow system. That means we have boundary layer, we have uh, uh, laminar sub layers. The question is really how they interact with the porous media and how we get this into a REV based concept. Then, of course, we have heterogeneities in a system. That means, for instance, different kind of soil heterogeneities and based on this, different kind of fluid, fluid and fluid, fluid, solid heterogeneities. How we get this into the, in our system. I hope you've got now a first impression about uh, the number of interfaces. So now let, let us have a short look to processes. What are the relevant processes? This is only a um, collection of processes. On one hand, we will have capillary pumping. Capillary pumping means we have parts with a tinier area, white space. We have parts with a more bigger white space. And related to this, we get a, pup, a capillary pumping of water from the lower part to the interface. Then, of course, it can be that we have mixing processes. If we have different kind of components in a system and related to the different layers that we have mentioned so far from the free flow, they have a strong influence on the mixing. That means it can be CO2, it can be methane, it can be vapor, and how they interact is with each other. And how does this influence on one hand the different layers, the viscous sublayer and the boundary layer, and of course, uh, vice versa, the mixing behavior. Then, of course, we have diffusion on one end and we have advection. You see the differences in the, uh, in the uh, description of diffusion and advection. That means diffusion is a more important part in comparison to adv advection. I will show you this later on. And last not least, we can have long and short turf, uh, short wave radiation. That means we have an input of energy, and this input of energy has an influence on the interfaces that I've mentioned so far, uh, too. Okay. I hope you have got an impression now. Now I will show you challenges. Okay. The first one is are we in a laminar or a turbulent boundary layer regime? That means, for instance, we can have a laminar flow on the top of the, of the porous media, or we can have a, a turbulent, turbulent one. For the laminar one, we have only bound, one boundary layer. But for the turbulent one, we have the viscous sublayer, that is the red marked one here. And then we have a turbulent boundary layer. And in the turbulent boundary layer, we have an optimal mixing. How interact with this, this, this with each other? How do this layer controls the exchange processes. The next one is related to stage one and it's stage two evaporation. What does it mean? At the beginning, if you have now 100% water saturated system, the water interact directly uh, to the free flow. That means you have a direct evaporation process from the liquid, from the liquid phase, from the water phase into the gaseous, the atmosphere. But if you get then and high evaporation, a drying process like what we have now in Germany, especially in the southern part of Germany, then the first part of the layer can be dry. That means there isn't any kind of liquid. Then, of course, you get a diffusion process controlled problem. That means the liquid is then a component, sorry, the vapor is then a component in the liquid phase. And based on this switch, you get a decrease of evaporation that shows this graph here. At the beginning, you have a high evaporation rate. Then if you switched what I've explained before uh, from the stage one to the stage two, then you get a strong decrease of evaporation from here to here. The question is, can we handle this? When does convection and then when does diffusion control the exchange process? In this case, we have more advection. In this case, we have more diffusion. The next one is <clears throat> related to heterogeneities. On one hand, we have the heterogeneity in the porous media. I called this capillary pumping before. That's a coarse material here. That's the fine material. It's clear. 
we have now a pumping from the cost to the fine. That means, for instance, we have a higher evaporation rate here in comparison to here related to the water table. These are measurements that we have done with Danny Orr together. This is at time level zero. That means, in this case, in both areas, cost and fine, we have had the same water level. After a while, after eight hours, we got now a decrease of the water table in the cost and a stable one in the fine related to this capillary pumping. And you see big difference in the temperature, four to five degrees. Why? Very simple. If you have a high evaporation based um, to the thermodynamic behavior, you got the decrease of the temperature. That's the reason why the temperature is much lower here in comparison to here, fine and coarse. The next one is the surface itself. Um, this uh, results from measurements uh, from Jülich, from Jan van der Borg. You see different, three different kinds of structures and three different kinds of temperatures. That means this one um, includes an, a lower evaporation, uh, sorry, a higher evaporation than this one. Why very simple? You have a lower temperature related to what I have explained before. That means the surface itself has a strong influence on the evaporation process and the structure too. Okay. The question is wet and dry patterns. Does the heterogeneity control the exchange processes dependent on the different scales? How we get this kind of scales into our models? Okay, next one, and it's really a tricky one, and it's really ongoing research, is really <clears throat> in the free flow, I mentioned this, we have the turbulent mixing. Okay, if you have a turbulent flow, then you see we have a really, really, really an instable flow regime and we have a turbulent mixing. And we have here a tiny viscous sublayer where the system is relatively stable. In the porous media, normally we assume that we have only diffusion or if we have higher velocities, then we combine this with dispersion. But how does this turbulent mixing influence the porous media behavior? And how does the porous media behavior influence the boundary layers and, of course, the turbulent mixing? Please think about what I've mentioned so far before. If you have more, more components, is it possible that you get the backflow from methane or CO2 from the free flow into the porous media one? Or is it possible that you get an optimal mixing, that you get a decrease of the CO2 or methane in the, por in the porous media? First one. Second one is you need, if you have more than one component, you need an extension of your Fickian law. You need a nonlinear description of your diffusion concept. Is it necessary to use maxwell stefan diffusion? And I will show you an example that's brand new, done by Katharina Heck from our team. This presents, presents of components here, methane and carbon dioxide, change the whole mixing behavior due to the different viscosities and densities. Why very simple? Uh, if you have more dissolved methane in the system, then you get an increase in density. You can get a change in viscosity. If you get a change into this, then of course, you get an influence of the exchange processes between your porous media and the free flow one. The question is here, sorry, mixing, what does it mean? Oops. Does the boundary layer, that means this layer here, you see it here, this layer, control mixing of different components dependent on the different fluid properties? And the key question is, is it, is it possible to use classical REV models or do we need any kind of new multi-scale approaches? That is one of the key problems and that is related to uh, the title of my topic. Let us go a little bit more into the details. I hope you are highly motivated now. Now we come to the last challenge, to the modeler challenge. Doesn't work, I don't know why. Okay, that is related to the models. If you be on the pore scale, okay, then you can use a continuous description of both areas of the free flow one and the porous media one. That means, for instance, you can use then volume of fluids, Navi Stokes equation, uh, or you can use Let It Boltzmann, and you can solve both the free flow and the porous media flow with the same concept. That's a consistent approach. 
But if you do it now based on an REV approach, that means that you assume that you have now volume-based uh, quantities developed for the REV. That means that you use Darcy or Forheimer if the, if the inertial force is important. Then you use the potential theory for the porous media one and the classical theory for the free flow. That means you get differences in the derivatives of your velocities and the description of the pressure. That is a non-consistent approach. And is it possible to make this approach consistent? That means, is it possible to find a somewhat consistent formulation on the REV scale? Question mark. Okay. So let us start. At first, long time ago, 10 years ago, we have started to develop an REV-based concept. That means free flow here, porous media flow here, and then we have used different kinds of interface conditions to solve this as good as possible. I will explain you this in the next 10 minutes, and then we will discuss on a few examples why it doesn't work. Okay, and what is necessary to do. And if you are interested on the details, please have a look uh, to this uh, papers and there are a bunch of other ones from other publication, uh, uh, published too. Okay, so free flow, porous media flow, and we have this sharp, sharp means in the form of the model concept itself. We have now an interface that allows the transfer back and forth from the free to the porous media one. Okay. So let me start with the porous media. I think I'm 100% sure you are familiar with this. REV concept, we used uh, multiphase Darcy's law or Forheimer if necessary, two fluid phases, gas and liquid, two components, air and water, non-isothermal equilibrium phase transition. Okay? And these are the unknowns, and we switch the unknowns if we have changes in the phases. Okay? The equations. I'm 100% sure familiar with this mass balance, storage term, flux term. Then we use the extended form of the Darcy's law with the relative permeability, viscosity, uh, um, um, density, and so on. Then, of course, we have the comp com uh, component mass balance. That's the mass fraction of each component in each phase. Alpha stands for liquid and gaseous phase, and K stands for the different components that I've mentioned so far before. We use the locally equilibrium concept so that we have only one energy equation. That means we have now the storage term here. Then we have the convective one with the enthalpy. Then we have the storage term for the solid phase. This is for the liquid, sorry, for the fluid phases. This is for the solid phase. And this is the part of conduction. And then we have a source and sink term. Okay. It's the same procedure for the free flow model. We have a laminar turbulent one. We use the RANS concept for the description of the turbulent behavior. We assume that we have a single phase system, the gaseous one. We have two components, air and water, non-isothermal, incompressible, and these are our unknowns. Okay, the same procedure as before, the continuity equation. Then we have the momentum equation, and I mentioned this, we use the RANS concept. That means we have the storage term, the inertial term, then we have the uh, viscos viscosity, the nature viscosity, then we have the eddy viscosity and the pressure gradient and the gravity term. We can do it for different components. I mentioned this again, that's the mass fraction, storage term, advection term, that is the diff classical diffusion, that it's the diffusion based on the turbulent part, this turbulent mixing, what I've mentioned so far before, and that's the source and sink term. And of course, you can use the same energy balance equation as before, that's the internal energy, that's the time-dependent term, the convective or advective term, that's the eddy diffusion, the mixing of energy related to turbulence. Then we have conduction, and the conduction is based on the classical uh, heat transfer coefficient, and then we have a mixing-related one related to the uh, turbulence flow. So this is similar what I've mentioned before for porous media. Now I come to the interface. As then I mentioned this, we assume that we have local thermodynamic equilibrium. We used continuity of fluxes. That means what's going in is equal to what's going out. And we use different kinds of conditions for the description of the momentum transfer back and forth from the free to the porous media one. Okay. Let us have a look to this. Let us start at first with a mechanical equilibrium. And you see now how tricky it is 
to get the interface as good as possible involved. Let me start with the normal one. If you be on the poor scale, then you know you have a normal one, uh, free flow solid, free flow gas, free flow gas, free flow gas, um, porous media um, liquid. Okay, and you can build then the equilibrium, and you know with the capillary pressure the differences in these two pressures. Then you can formulate this and. 100% clear, it's not so easy, why? Very simple, you see it here. The pressure in the free flow is different to the pressure in the porous media. Why very simple? In the porous media, we use the potential theory, I mentioned this so far, and in the free flow, we use the whole theory. That means if you check the forces, then we have the inertial force, we have the shear stress force, we have the pressure force, from the free flow, and we have only one force, the pressure force in the porous media. And the tricky thing in this case is the pressures are not the same at the interface, okay? And this is not so easy to handle this from the thermodynamic point of view. I will come back to this. Okay, if we do it now for this tangential one, then we have a non-slip for this one, solid, a gas, we have a slip for gas, gas, and we have another slip condition for gas and the uh, liquid water phase. And what we do, we sum up all these kind of things, mix this a little bit, and then of course we use the Pfeiffer and Joseph condition. Pfeiffer and Joseph condition means that there is one average quantity that we can use for the description of the different um, slip conditions to transfer this in this uh, parametrization. Um, that works very well for tangential flow fields, but if you have a perpendicular one, then you get a lot of trouble. I will show you this. I hope you got now an impression. Let me come to the last two ones. Component, very easy. What's going in, it's equal to what's going out. We assume that we have a local equilibrium. We assume, and that it's not really correct. Why? The pressures are not the same, and then, from the Gibson law, it can be not the case that the concentration and the temperatures are the same, but we assume this, okay? So in this case, we get then that the flux, the mass flux of the free flow is equal to the mass flux of the porous media one. And the porous media flux based on the, from the gaseous one and the liquid one, and in the free flow, we have only the gaseous one. The energy is the same. The same procedure as before, local equilibrium, based on the assumption that I've mentioned so far, we got the same temperatures, and then we got the fluxes, we get the free flow flux, that means convection, then conduct, uh, sorry, convection, then we have the conduct, uh, uh, convection from the, from the, um, nah, from the turbulent one, and we can, we got conduction here. And it's the same here. We get then here the gaseous uh, energy transfer, the con convection one, the liquid convection one, and the conduction one. Okay? I hope you got an impression now. So now we go into the details. Uh, sorry, last slide before we go into the details. Sorry, you can use different kind of discretization schemes. We used for this a uh, finite volume scheme that is a... Um, a multi-point flux, non-linear multi-point flux approximation developed by uh, Martin, Dennis, and partly by Kilian, where we have now the uh, unknowns at the interface. That means the primal variables are fixed at the interface. Okay. And of course, with this approach, we can include anisotropic behavior of the porous media. We can include uh, uh, heterogeneities and so on as good as possible. Okay. We are prepared now. Now I will do an, exam an, an experiment with you to get an impression, that you get an impression. I think that it's done in cooperation with our friend and colleague, Danny Orr from the ETH Zurich together. You see here the porous media, and this is the wind tunnel. And initially the porous media was 100% filled with water. And we have now a dry flow of air on the top from the left to the right. And now the idea was really to check really the evaporation process from the porous to the free flow one, okay? This is the setup here, the porous media, and that's the free flow one. Here are the numbers, okay? You see, 
at the beginning, the porous media was slightly 100% water saturated. Now we have the flux here from the left. And this is the uh, vapor in the gaseous phase, relatively dry. And now we will see how it works, OK? That means we are really interested on the cross section along this green line. And we are interested on stage one, stage two, temperature, concentration, and so on. Let me start with this. OK, the, mean, the, the, the question is really, can we reproduce this kind of behavior in general? OK, yes, we can. I will show you this. So on the left-hand side, you see the evaporation rate over time. OK, here in, on the uh, two other ones, that's the liquid water saturation. That's the vapor in the gaseous phase here. And this describes the temperature, OK? Let me start with the first one. Now we get this evaporation. We get the decrease of the water table here related to the decrease of the saturation of the first parts of the porous media. You see, we get a decrease in temperature related to the high evaporation rate. OK. And we have a constant vapor in the gaseous phase in the porous media and the constant one a constant not but this one in the free flow system okay so now we come to the next part now we reached now we reached the um, transfer from the stage one where the liquid phase con is in, in, interacting with the free flow and you see what's going on we have now tiny parts of water in the first part of the porous media and of course all the other ones are relatively stable now we will see how it, how it works. So now we get this decrease. Hey, what's going on? We get a decrease, but now we get an increase of vapor in the free flow one. That means the process is not fast enough. We are now in the other time scale so that we get a higher vapor concentration in the gaseous phase of the porous media. And of course, you see, we get an increase of temperature. Why? We got a deep decrease of evaporation. If you get a deep decrease of evaporation, then of course, we get an increase of temperature related to the thermodynamic conditions. You know this very well. We have now 30, 35 degrees of Celsius in Stuttgart. And if you go outside and you check your skin, then you have the feeling, wow, it's cold and wet. Why very simple? Uh, uh, your, your body will control your temperature with evaporation. and if it's hot outside, then you have a high evaporation rate from your body outside to the atmosphere to get this kind of cooling that I have presented so far before. Okay. So now, ah, that is stupid. I will show you why it doesn't work. We, have, we are so proud and we published this. And then we have checked this on the pore scale with uh, Danny Orr together, we published this. And then we got these results. We compared this with measurements. These are the real measurements from the setup that I have presented before. And these are the calculations that we got of the evaporation. I think these are far away from real good results. I hope you agree with me. What is the reason for this, my friends? The reason is we cannot approximate really the interface-driven processes, especially in the in between the interface of the free, the free and the porous media one. What is necessary to do? Of course, there are a lot of papers related to this. We need um, a multi-scale approach. And that's done by Kilian. What we have done now, we have approximated the first part of the layer here, of the porous media layer, with a poor network model. And then, of course, this poor network model is coupled with a RV model on one hand and with the free flow on the other one. What are the advantages? I hope I have a few minutes more to explain it to you. Let me start. And um, I hope you have had the time to listen to Martin's presentation about poor network models. And uh, uh, if you have a little bit of money, please buy the book from uh, Martin. It's published in 2017, where you get all the details about poor network models. The poor network model describes the poor network in a simplified, reduced complex 
concept. That means you have only one D flow from one body to another one based on a Poisson equation. So I would like to do it now. That means this is the free flow. This, this, you are the familiar now, now with this equation, continuity equation, the momentum, the Navier-Stokes equation. Now we get the power network model equation. That means the Poisson equation from one body to another one. Okay. And we have done it for multi-phase flow and for multi-phase multi-component systems. But what's going on at the interface now? as one of the very important interfaces between the free and the porous media one. These are the forces here. We have the shear stress here. We have the slip here. That's the profile of the velocity in the free flow. These are the velocities in the porous media one. And the question is now, do we get really a good balance between these two momentum transfer processes between the free and the porous one back and forth? Yes, we can. So what we have done, we have build the balance between the free flow and the porous media flow at this interface. Then, of course, we built the ratio of the viscosities and we included a beta factor. The beta factor describes here the geometry in the geometrical behavior of the pores. It can be bigger, smaller, a circle, and so on. And then you get a new slip condition. And then, of course, you have then the transfer with this slip velocity that allows you to have a momentum transfer back and forth between the free and the porous media one. Is it okay? Yes, it is. I will show you this. Okay. Uh, this is what we have done so far from the numerical point of view. I mentioned this. We have now here a staggered grid concept used for the free flow. We have a self-centered and a box scheme, both of them developed for the power network model. And these are calculations done by Kilian for the interaction between the free and the porous media one. Okay, now we come back to the physics, the next few minutes. That's a setup that we have developed uh, with uh, Vahid from Manchester, it's 2D and 3D, but I will show you only 2D examples. That's the porous media, that's the free flow one. And at first we assume that the flow in the free flow is tiny, very tiny Reynolds number. And we have now a bigger pressure, higher pressure here. That means we have now a pressure field from the porous into the free flow one. You see what's going on. We have outflow and inflow. That means we get really circles, eddies from the free flow to the porous media one. How does it look like if we increase the Reynolds number? Then of course, we see now here the boundary layer. This is the blue one here. And we have now strong interactions again between the free and the porous media one. And if you compare this with our REV model, then you get uh, differences, big differences. And that depends really on the local behavior of slip and non-slip exchange uh, and the exchange between the porous and the free flow one at the interface controlled by the boundary layer. Okay. And uh, now I come to the last part of my presentation. Now we have transferred our power network model to the non isothermal one, to what we have so far done before with this evaporation. Oh, what's going on? Of course, you can use different kind of tubes. This tube is the classical one, or you can use this tube, but this tube has a more advanced concept. Why? Then you have really parts that interact with the surface. That means, for instance, then you have really an interaction from, if, if the, the, the um, water table decreases from these tiny parts into the free flow. That means that is more realistic for complex porous media than this one. Okay. So now can be reproduced stage one and stage two and can be reproduced really the flow field as the interface between the free and the porous media. Only here in this case for the evaporation. Yes, we can. You see here, this is in the, in the case stage one where the whole porous media is filled with water. You get then this kind of interaction that I've mentioned so far, you get the smoothening of the system here and you can reproduce it here very well with our tiny porous, uh, pore network model as an interaction between free flow, the porous media approximated on the pore scale and the IV based Darcy scale. Okay, now I come to the 
stage transfer, stage two. And in stage two, you get this kind of very important uh, uh, diffusion processes. Why? You get now, oh, let me write it down. If I have two minutes, I will write it down. That is really interesting. You get now the flux, that's this one here. It's minus D gradient of the concentration. What is the gradient? The gradient depends strongly on this D here. That means in this case here, you have a very low concentration of the vapor. And here at the interface, you have a relatively high concentration of the vapor in the gaseous phase. So that you get dependent on the thickness. Oh, that was not a good idea. On the thickness of the boundary layer an increase or decrease of diffusion, first statement. The second statement, he, here you get this direct gradient, the direct flux. But here, if you get now a drop, the gradient is not directly approximated from here to here. The gradient is related to, I would like to say, a mushroom structure. Why? Very simple. Diffusion has an elliptic behavior, a diffusive behavior. You get this kind of structure, then you get this kind of diffusive behavior from the pores into the free flow. There's a strong influence. Can we, represent, can we do it with our model? Yes, we can. Sorry. You see it here. We can approximate now here. These ones are empty ones. This is filled with water. And you get then really this kind of behavior that I have shown here uh, with this uh, more uh, abstraction of the process itself. And of course, we get an influence of the flux from the left to the right hand side. You see it here on the arrows that shows the flux, the vapor flux from the pores into the free flow one. Okay, let me come to the end. We have done different kind of other studies. Uh, we try now, we have published two of them. The other ones are in preparation. And you see how it works now. Oh, sorry. How it works, ah. how it works now. You get the free flow, and this is not a symmetric process. Why? You get a higher uh, uh, flux from the porous to the free flow here than here. Why? The, the boundary layer is thinner here than here. That means the diffusive flux and the conductive flux of heat is stronger here than here. And you see how it works, how complex it is, but with this concept, you can approximate this. Okay, let me finalize my presentation. That was really the introductory part. Why is this so important for environmental problems? Especially if you think about the climate change, it has a strong influence on the coupling between the water cycle and the porous media on one hand. But on the other one, that is related to salt precipitation. Why? If you get a higher increase of evaporation, then of course, you get less water in the system. If you have less water in the system, then you get a higher increase of the dissolved salt in the rest of the water. And at the end, you get salt precipitation processes. And it can be, and that's one of the biggest problems in the surrounding of the Mauritanian Sea, for instance, uh, then a decoupled uh, system between the atmosphere and the porous media. That means if you get rain, then the rain cannot infiltrate into the porous media and you get really a lot of erosion problems and uh, other environmental related problems. We have started with this on the REV scale. It works very well, but we, have, we, have, we saw that doesn't work. Why? The salt is a crust on the top and the salt builds their own porous media with tinier pores. If they have tinier pores, higher capillary forces, higher capillary pumping. That means if you are really interested on this, then we must go back to the uh, pore scale. These are first measurements that we have done in cooperation with Dr. Wildenfeld from Oregon. That shows really how it works. That is the top three of a porous media of a column here. And you see on the top, you get then the salt precipitation processes. And the question is really, how we can transfer this with the models into real cases to solve this kind of very important environmental um, problems. We are still working now on uh, roughness, surface roughness, and topological roughness, especially if you think about radiation. Then, of course, if the sun uh, comes from the left to the right, you get different kind of behaviors and you get different kind of mixing processes related to the structure. 
And if you like it, you are invited to visit us, to come to us, to discuss with us, and try to solve these problems with us together. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, this is the whole team uh, from our department. And uh, I would like to thank all of them, and especially you, uh, that you were willing to listen to me. Uh, and uh, I hope you will have a lot of questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Breiner, for this very inspiring talk. Obviously, for this very inspiring talk, it's, it's not an effort <laughs> to listen to. Uh, uh, so we have already plenty of questions. I would, without further ado, I would like to uh, give the uh, floor to Florian to share the discussion. Yeah, let me also thank you, Weiner, uh, for this uh, really inspiring. Also, thank you to uh, the audience, uh, as the questions are already uh, coming in uh, almost faster than I'm able to read. <laughs> so uh, the first question came uh, from Musa. In porous media, given the level of uncertainty, how much scientific gain adding more complexity by considering the coupling of laminar and turbulent flow? Um, and, uh, and would you recommend an adaptive dynamic, spatially or temporally, Darcy Stokes coupling? <laughs> uh, you will get a longer answer, my friend. The first one is, uh, one year ago, <laughs> that it's a little bit dangerous to mention this, one year ago, one and a half year ago, uh, I have had a strong discussion with Eva, Ivan Jotov and uh, Vizebo. And I told him, hey, uh, let us do this kind of decoupling and uh, new strategies. And we have started with this. And please believe me, we have, we have now already a very nice paper, but this is not a solution. Now I come back to this. My feeling is if you are really interested on real appli applications, then we need really a new dispersion concept. What does it mean a new dispersion concept? That is related to, um, if, if it's possible, no, if it's possible, you can see my screen, huh? Yes. One yes, minute. Um, then yes, you see it here. Here, we have a strong mixing of the system. You can see it here. Here, we have a less strong mixing, but this mixing influenced this mixing here. And we are still working now on a dispersion concept that includes this fluctuations on the different scales in space and time as an average quantity between the porous and the free flow one. And we solve this with machine learning. Why? We have a lot of detailed data, and we cannot include this in a fine scale approach. And the hope is now with this machine learning to learn about this and to get better parameterizations that we can use then for a dispersion concept that describes the mixing between these two compartments from the free and the porous media one. And then you can use really a simplified concept for the Starks, Stokes, Navis Stokes, uh, porous media for fractures and for free flow, what I've presented here too. Short question, long answer. I hope that was the that was okay. I I definitely think so. So um, uh, the next question is by uh, Sarah. In reactive yeah. transport in porous media, such as acidization around the well to enhance productivity, the wormholes will be created, which means the interface between porous and non-porous media yeah. changes. Uh, the uh, mean question to this, how can we appropriately model this? <laughs> uh, is it Sarah Gesta? <laughs> then she knows this. Uh, no. Oh, it's an other Sarah. Sorry. Sarah, uh -huh. uh, Sarah, what we are doing in our collaborative research center is we have a team, Holger and other ones, they're working with colleagues from Montana State University to, together on biofilms. And what we have done so far in the last 10 years, we have included in the concepts biofilm growth and biofilm detachment. And what we try now, we try now to combine and couple this biofilm concept on the REV and 
we have started to do it on the poor scale with this free flow one. And parallel to this, another group from Bozeman and from Stuttgart, uh, Holger Steep and Holger Klass, they are working on experiments too, so that we have a basis to analyze this and verify this. But I think that is really ongoing research work. So the next question is coming from Alex Machado. You mentioned the importance of the Maxwell uh, Stefan model for diffusion in gas systems. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be important in the flow of liquid mixtures, such as CO2 rich brine? I think, sorry, we have done tests related to this. And uh, that is not, my impression that is not so relevant. You need really components with different behaviors, with different uh, densities. Uh, uh, Katharina has done this uh, with uh, Insa Neuweiler and uh, colleagues from, TU, uh, from, um, from Denmark, from TUD together, where we have had mixes, mixtures of CO2, of methane, and other components. Then it's relevant. But if the components have the same behavior, then I think Fick in law with other words, the binary, uh, binary diffusion concept is, I would like to say, it's good enough. That uh, is what we have got from the calculations that we have done. So uh, uh, a less uh, uh, um, specific scientific question, but still uh, very interesting uh, <laughs> by Pu Wai Huang. Hi, Rainer, your book published in 1997. It's an unfair really question. It's a really fundamental piece of literature for transport por processes in porous media. And the obvious question then is, when is the new edition coming? What a nice <laughs> question. What a nice <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, that is an unfair question. But I think um, there is a, I would try to be fair. Last year, I've had a sabbatical and I've, uh, I've worked as good as possible on the book. 670 pages are now ready. It's a little bit thicker than the old one with all this kind of coupling concepts and so on involved. And uh, Peter Knapner, one of my good friends, he's now starting to make a, a proofreading. And um, if he is not too tough, then I try to publish this next year. And this is confidential. Uh, Right now, really we ready. are live. We are live. Then, yeah, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> and please ask me, ask me again, ask me this question again next year. I hope I can offer you then a PDF file of the new version. We will invite you next year for, for another talk then. That be... Hadi, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> we can give you a session at Interpol in Edinburgh. <laughs> that's my pleasure. I want my book. Yeah, it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question so uh, from Christine Meyer thank you for the great talk Rainer if I understand co it correctly in your porous medium you model liquid vapor phase transitions would yeah. you also be able to model a solid liquid vapor phase transition and would such a model be able to simulate the melting of permafrost for example? <laughs> in the first part uh, we have done it. For instance, we have uh, this. Uh, uh, um, you can please send me an email. Uh, then I can send you the publications that we have prepared for this. We can describe now um, salt for REV bay for for the REV scale. We can describe now a different kind of salt types. We can describe the precipitation process, and of course, we can describe this with the free flow and the. Uh, the whole evaporation process. But the other way around, we haven't included any kind of ice concepts so far. So that is not included. Um, we haven't, and we haven't thought about it. I've had a strong discussion two years ago with Jan, Jan Nordbotten, and one guy from, from the, um, this year with um, Bremerhaven. They are the, this is the center in Germany. The, and uh, they are really interested on this. And uh, we have planned now to make a workshop related to this to see how we can interact about this. But sorry, you can get this salt precipitation, salt, and so on with different kinds of reaction processes and so on. But ice and this concept is not involved. And I haven't any clue how I can solve it. <laughs> 
So next question from uh, L.F. Young. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the great presentation. I wonder, is there the effect of concentration of, sal uh, of saline water or let's say surface tension wettability on the evaporation? Yes. <laughs> yes, that is involved. And <laughs> um, try to be fair. Uh, yes, is it involved and it's important. And we are still working on the influence on the contact angle change. That's in cooperation with uh, Joachim Groß together. Uh, he's working on the molecular scale. And I hope we hope with the different components and concentrations that we get a description of the change of the contact angle on the whole system so that we can implement this as easy as possible to get this as good as possible approximated. If you like it, I can send you this stuff. So now we have a, a more a mathematical, technical question. Okay, I like this. <laughs> ah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so hello, Rainer. Great talk and very motivating. So you mentioned the monolithic approach and Newton's method when solving the porous free flow, porous free flow model. Do you That's encounter not... any convergence issues? <laughs> so, Rin, my old friend, you know this very well. We have a lot of trouble with this. And you know, Dominic is still working with us. And uh, we used uh, uh, we used a linear solver for this kind of things. And now we have started uh, to try to decouple this as good as possible. That it's But it's really, really tricky. And our hope is now to get a better understanding so that we can do uh, um, that we can use a model reduction strategy and based on this a more decoupled one so that we get really a more in this uh, iterative business and not in this direct one Zorin, this is one of the key problems that we have but on the other hand Zorin, you know this we have worked strongly with uh, eva uh, together and uh, Zorin, you have published papers related to this too. I know this very well. And uh, if you are really interested on this difficult, highly nonlinear interactive processes, then it's really tough to use domain decomposition ones or any kind of overlap ones that uh, Alfio Quadriodi, Quarioni, well, sorry, has has mentioned. We have checked this and um, hmm, we have implemented this and we haven't got any kind of good results. With other words, the hope is to find an extremely good mathematician that helps us to make our stiffness matrix as good as possible smoother. Let me say it like this one. That's, sorry, Surin. I agree with you 100%. That is a weak point. Florin, um, maybe you want to pick uh, the few few uh, questions. Yes. We, oh. The time is up, so, so maybe so, so, want um, more uh, max uh, or something. There's one more question uh, in the uh, comments that I'd like to raise, and then I also have a, a, a final question. I'll take the liberty there. So uh, it's from Kishan Kumar, and uh, mm -hmm. it's an interesting one, uh, pr probably in particular for. Um, um, maybe junior researchers attending here uh, in, in the decision-making process. When uh, you saw the uh, different trends in experimental and numerical results when you uh, presented this uh, evaporation experiment mm -hmm. together with mm -hmm. your, that's a, how that's did a you conclude that the approximation is wrong? And that, mm -hmm. um, uh, that um, it's very simple to, to say, uh, our, all our projects that we have, that we have are in interacting or in cooperation with excellent experimentalists. And this was 10 years ago, that was a, or nine years ago, that was a project with uh, Danny Orr and other ones together. And uh, one of our former PhD student, uh, Klaus Mostaf, he's now uh, assistant professor in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Uh, we have done the experiments. Then I was so stupid and have uh, told Klaus, Klaus, it's easy. I would like to write down the equations. Then we can implement this and then we can calculate this. That was the first mistake from my side. The second mistake from my side was if we have done the comp comparison study that we were far away from the measurements uh, that we have seen from uh, that we have done with Danny together and our calculations. And then we have started to analyze this step by step in detail. And that makes fun, that is research. Uh, why very simple? You learn step by step more about this 
Then you go in this direction, in this direction. And it's great if you can do it in a team, not in a local one, in an international one. And uh, two of our good cooperators are the heads of this here. That's Hardy, uh, Florian, you know this very well. You were in Stuttgart, you have done your PhD in Stuttgart. And of course, other ones too. That means that is really, you need a good team. You must be involved in a good team. And you need a team with different kind of perspectives and knowledge. And then you can see immediately where is the mistake. And then it's nice to identify this, discuss about this, and see what can you do to overcome uh, uh, this kind of problem. Long answer to a short question, sorry. Am I am I still uh, thank you, Rainer? Am I still allowed to ask my question? Hardy? Of course. Of course. You, Sorry, you, Hardy is the boss. Oh, host. <laughs> so Rainer, um, you've presented um, uh, you started with the IEV concept and yeah. to, uh, uh, the question of being able to represent processes by average quantities over an IEV. Mm -hmm. And you figured out that that doesn't work always uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, very nicely. And mm -hmm. so then uh, you uh, you presented this nice work of uh, reconstructing, uh, or uh, uh, not reconstructing, looking at finer scales uh, and um, essentially representing the interface either by um, your poor network model or trying to teach uh, an, an artificial intelligence, uh, a machine learning algorithm to translate over this interface. In your work over the last decades, have you uh, like established a feeling when an effective, simple algebraic model or maybe uh, just a, a simple um, differential equation that would, uh, uh, that would help us to bridge the interface in a uh, without forcing you to to go to the smaller scale mm -hmm. when when uh, this is uh, there's hope for success and when we just have to bite the bullet and um, um, go down to the small scale uh, um, thank you much for this very nice question uh, Florian uh, the, the, the first challenge is, our classical approach is based on volume-based uh, volume based quantities. But if you are really interested on reaction processes, on non-equilibrium processes, then this process take care at the local interface, the local interface, the fluid, 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 solid interface. And what we must do is to get a better understanding about this interface, interface driven processes on the finer scale on the poor scale and transfer this to, I would call this in generally dispersion related concepts that we get really locally, that we get globally, the local interface concepts as good as possible uh, uh, approximated. And important is that we get an understanding where are the interfaces. That means I have shown you different kind of interfaces, free flow, different kind of free flow interfaces, different kind of compartment interfaces, different kind of porous media, fluid, 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 solid interfaces. We need a clear understanding on which scale in space and time is this interface relevant. And if we cannot approximate this interface, then we need a multi-scale approach. That means locally where the front takes care, we need a poor scale, and then we must integrate this poor scale approach approach as easily as possible in the global one. Um, Hadi, that is strongly related to your multi-scale approach that you have developed with other ones together the last years. Uh, in, in, it is in the same range. Uh, um, Florian, that is not really the black-white answer. The answer is really, if you have a knowledge about this, then we must see what is important. Think about reaction. If we think about reactive processes, we need this interface. If we do not reproduce this, then we get reaction only as an average quantity. If we are happy with this, of course. If, but if we are really interested on the details, then we need really where the reaction takes place, this interface as a local scale, finer scale approach in a global REV scale concept. That is the idea uh, that we have in mind for the next years. 
Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Florin and, and Reiner and all the attendees for this very uh, engaging discussion session. Uh, we had plenty also acknowledgements. Uh, your colleagues at uh, Stuttgart Reiner sends you uh, best wishes. Uh, <laughs> also are mentioning they cannot wait until they see the next book, hopefully below a thousand pages. If <laughs> So oh, that, uh, that was a big mistake from my side. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, again, I would like to also take the chance to announce uh, our next week uh, webinar. It is going to be uh, delivered by um, a Professor Massa Prodanovic from uh, UT Austin. Massa will present a talk on what does it take to automate digital rock petrophysics. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, will be our next week uh, webinar uh, until next week please uh, stay happy uh, healthy tuned and we see you next week thank you very much again have a nice week thank you very much to all of you and uh, enjoy your time and uh, thanks to Hadi and to Florin and I hope we can see us as soon as possible face to face stay well bye 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 everyone Florin bye bye, bye, -bye.